It is such a pleasure to get to be here with you this evening, returning to Atlanta as both a Duke alum, but also a professor at Duke, to have the opportunity to talk with you about my research, which is at the intersection of law, ethics, and the biosciences. Consider this. The average person, including you, thinks about 70,000 thoughts per day. As you think those thoughts, neurons are firing in your brain. As those neurons fire, they're giving off tiny electrical discharges. And as many neurons interact, they form patterns that give rise to thoughts like a math calculation or an emotional state like paying attention, which I hope you're all doing. As a, a singular emotional state emerges, like relaxation, for example, hundreds of thousands of neurons start firing in the brain. And they do so concurrently in a way that can be measured by something like EEG. EEG is electroencephalography. And back here, if you're wondering what it is that you're seeing, and hopefully that we're going to be hearing in just a moment, what you're seeing is, in fact, EEG activity. And you're seeing it happening in real time, and you're hearing it happening in real time, but you don't quite know where it's coming from, do you? Well, you all met John earlier this evening. Many of you have met him in the past. And I'd like to invite him to come up on stage with us now, because John's been kind enough to let you not only get to know his face, get to know his voice, but he's now sharing with us his brain. Thank you, John, for being up on stage and allowing us to see your real-time brain activity. Now, what's happening here in the background? What's happening is John is relaxing, because it's so relaxing to be on stage in front of everyone. And as he relaxes, his brain state gets to a place where the concurrent firing of the neurons is between about 8 to 12 hertz. And that 8 to 12 hertz is called an alpha wave. The alpha wave activity, as he gets up to the green area, shows that he's really at the maximally relaxed state. And that's pretty remarkable. You can see this happening right now. So let's all be quiet for a moment so we can really relax in front of all of us for just a moment here. Pretty good, right? Pretty impressive. So this is a remarkable device. What, what he is wearing is one of the first consumer-based EEG devices that's available to any of us in order to purchase. And what's remarkable about it is that we're seeing his brain activity in real time, and it's being decoded here on the screen for us to be able to see. This is something we all have access to. Now, you might be wondering the second remarkable thing about this, which is, how is he wearing this wireless headset, and you're seeing his brain activity up on the screen? The way that that's happening is, this is communicating with an iPhone that's in the back of the room via Bluetooth technology, via an app that's on that iPhone that lives also in a cloud server. So all of John's brain activity has just gone to the app manufacturer as well and is living in the cloud as well. I hope you knew that, John. I hope they told you that before we did this. So there's something you should know if you don't already know about Bluetooth technology, about iPhones, and about apps, which is they're not particularly secure, which means that the average hacker could hack in right now and see what's happening in John's brain, which means the NSA can not only do things like listen into your phone calls or read your emails, they may soon be able to have access to your brain activity as well. So soon we may have spying activity if we all don these devices. Now, why would you possibly don this device, you wonder? I'm going to explain that to you. John, thank you so much for sharing your brain activity with us today. We really are grateful. Everybody give him a round of applause. <laughs> these devices and the one that John had on right now, this is just one of many of these new consumer-based devices that are on the market. And they offer some tremendous promise. For example, a person who has epilepsy, if they were to wear one of these devices, would have an alert that they were going to have an epileptic seizure before the seizure actually occurs. A person who has diabetes could know whether or not they were going to go into insulin shock before they ever reach that point. Certainly, individuals like that would want to wear it. How many of you have ever driven a car while drowsy? Just a show of hands. Yeah, if everybody doesn't have their hand up, you're lying. <laughs> And it turns out that drowsiness is the leading cause of accidents in this country. And Jaguar has just installed into the headrest of their cars 
EEG devices in order to detect a person becoming drowsy. And insurance companies are investing tremendous amounts of money to see whether or not they could get individual drivers to wear these while driving. They offer great promise, but they also have peril. What happens when all of this brain activity is something that's available to your insurance company, to your healthcare manufacturer, to all of your employers? What would happen? These are the kinds of questions that I explore in my research. The intersection of neuroscience, biosciences, law, and ethics. These are complex problems, but right now these EEG devices are one-way devices, meaning they just read activity. They don't change what's happening in the brain. But of course, we can change what's happening in the brain as well. So we can change your brain activity just like we can access your brain activity. This is Hobby J. Hobby J is not smarter than you, but he is smarter than the smartest of the long Evans rats, which is the smartest breeds of rats. The reason is because Hobby J is a transgenic rat whose brain has been altered to increase the receptors of the brain that enable him to remember things longer. Hobby J can remember things three times longer than the smartest rat that's out there, which is fantastic because it gives us information about important targets in the brain for drugs for humans who are suffering from memory loss, which is really promising for things like Alzheimer's disease or dementia, or students who wants to take an exam and wants to remember things a little bit longer. Now, I hear some, tw some, some laughs, but a little discomfort as well, because it's true. These drugs have dual-use purposes. Is that a bad thing? Is it a good thing? Would it be cheating for a student to take a drug in order to enhance their ability to remember things for an exam, particularly if they didn't have a deficit, they just wanted to strengthen the synapses in their brain that would enable them to remember? You're all familiar, I'm sure, with the controversy in sports about the use of performance-enhancing drugs or the fall from grace for somebody like Lance Armstrong, Roger Clemens, people who we question whether or not they are really the kind of talent we want to celebrate, natural, honed talent, rather than something that's artificially enhanced. But is the same hold true for something like our brain? Aren't we in the business of trying to enhance our brains in any way possible? Is there a problem with taking a drug or using a device in order to do so? Is it cheating to take a drug that improves your performance. So the targets for Hobby J are promising, but there's an even more promising drug that's already on the market. This is one that you might want to know about. It's called modafinil. Modafinil is a very powerful drug that was first tested in Air Force pilots as an alternative to caffeine because of the jitters that come along with caffeine. And what they found was that Air Force pilots who took these drugs did better having no sleep on performance IQ tests as well as motor coordination tests than the Air Force pilots who had seven hours of sleep per night. And what works for Air Force pilots works for all of us as well. There was a recent meta-analysis that was just published that shows that modafinil is a powerful cognitive enhancer. Is it cheating to take it if you're a student in school? It may be if you're at Duke University, which is the first university in the country to have as part of its cheating honor code that it is cheating to take a performance-enhancing drug without a prescription, without a need to do so. But is it cheating? These are the kinds of questions that we as a society have to answer and address and decide. These aren't easy questions, but they are questions that we, together at Duke, are seeking to address and we as a society have to address. Just as we can rev up our brain, we can slow it down as well. In fact, I suspect some of you already did that if you had a glass of wine, and you may do so again afterwards. But this drug is one that you may all be familiar with, or many of you may be. It's an ordinary beta blocker, which is used to treat heart conditions. And it also may have a powerful effect on memory. That is, if a rape victim comes in to a hospital, or another person suffering a trauma within the first 24 hours after the trauma and is given a dose of propanolol. They may remember what happened, but not the fear memory associated with what happens, which means that they won't develop PTSD like one third of rape victims who would otherwise, which is a wonderful thing, but also has potential consequences. Could that individual still testify against the perpetrator of their crime despite the fact that their memory has been altered? If they sue the perpetrator, will they also be able to recover damages? Or will we reduce the amount of damages that they would recover because their pain and suffering has been lessened? Will we in society come to think 
of things like rape or war as less problematic because we're able to dampen our memories against them? These are the kinds of issues that I address in my scholarship, which looks at the intersection of law, ethics, and science. I ask questions like, does the US Constitution keep up with technological change, and is it able to protect us against the coming types of issues that may be presented by neuroscience or genetics? Does the First Amendment include, for example, freedom of thought? And if it does, how far does that go? Are we able to change our thoughts? Are we able to alter them and access them? Can society and the government place restrictions upon them? Does the Fourth Amendment of the US Constitution, which guards us against unreasonable searches and seizures, prevent the NSA from listening into John's brain? Or prevent the NSA from listening into any of ours? And many of you may think that privacy is dead. This is a refrain that we hear from the next generation and the next generation after that. But most of us, I think, would think that our brains deserve some special protection, that you wouldn't want what you're thinking to be clearly and visibly available to anyone. But there is no such protection today. These are the kinds of issues that we have to decide as a society. Do we wish to have a special place, a thing called mental privacy? And we have to ask who can have access to information. Recently, the Food and Drug Administration shut down a company called 23andMe, which provided direct-to-consumer genetic information. You could send away a saliva sample and get a great deal of information about your health predispositions. And the FDA decided that they needed to safeguard individuals from receiving that information directly, that it might be to our peril to know things directly about ourselves without having a physician there to discern and explain that information. Will they decide the same thing about EEG technology or other brain access technologies? Do you have a right to access information about yourself? Is it your information? Do you own it? Or does somebody else have a right to access it because they have figured out a way to monetize it and market it? These are the questions that undercut all of big data right now, and they're equally applicable to questions about access to your brain. These are the issues that I explore in my research in partnership with a number of collaborators across campus. And Duke is a uniquely exciting place to study these questions. We do interdisciplinary in a way that no one else in the country is able to do. Recently at Duke, we launched a new initiative called the Duke Initiative for Science and Society. Well, we're exploring the questions that I've been talking about today and many more. We're training scientists and students to be able to ask questions, not just about what the next scientific innovation and next technological change may be, but how those technological changes impact society and are able to impact society more fruitfully and better. How can we bring science to the world in the service of society rather than just a new innovation? We also recently launched a new master's in bioethics and science policy and graduated our first class this past August. These are students who are all going out to take on new leadership roles to try to address the most complex issues about how science and technology impacts the world. And the Duke Initiative for Science and Society is a campus-wide initiative that has partners across the campus, and one of our key partners is Duke Law School. We've recently launched a new JDMA program to train the next generation of leaders to be able to go out and be equipped to answer the complex legal, ethical, and regulatory issues that govern technology. Through the Duke Initiative for Science and Society, Duke Law School, and the broader Duke community, we're asking the hard questions about how do we move the world forward with science and with technology, but do so in a way that's responsible. Because good science is about responsible science. It's about training responsible scientists to ask the hard questions and to be able to bring forth technological change and scientific discoveries in the service of society. Thank you.